My name is Nishant Gupta. I am an assistant professor at the University of Cincinnati. Today I am going to talk about some of the uncommon interstitial lung diseases that can be encountered in the clinical practice. Let's start with a case presentation. The case I am going to present is of a 63-year-old white female that was referred to our clinic for further evaluation of interstitial lung disease. The patient's main symptoms included exertional shortness of breath and non-productive cough. These symptoms had been present for approximately one year. The symptoms were gradually progressive and the patient was placed on supplemental oxygen a few weeks prior to her clinic visit. Her review of systems was negative, except for a history of non-specific pain in both legs for the past few months. The patient's past medical history included gastroesophageal reflux disease, hyperlipidemia, and depression. The patient was a lifelong non-smoker and reported no inhalational drug abuse. Her medications included a proton pump inhibitor for reflux disease, phenofibrate for hypertriglyceridemia, an SSRI for the depression, and as needed acetaminophen for the leg pain. Pertinent positives on the physical examination included mild to moderate oxygen desaturation at rest with the resting oxygen saturation of 92% on room air, and bilateral basilar crackles. Laboratory evaluations looking for autoimmune diseases were unrevealing for a definite connective tissue disease. Baseline pulmonary function tests, as shown on the slide, revealed a mild restrictive disease along with moderate reduction in the diffusion capacity. Six-minute walk test revealed mild to moderate exertional oxygen desaturation to 88% on room air. Here I am showing you selected cuts from the high-resolution chest CT scan. On the left-hand column are the coronal views, and the horizontal yellow line on the coronal cuts corresponds to the axial cut seen adjacent to it. The first arrow is pointing towards pleural thickening seen in the right upper lobe, and the second arrow is pointing towards the mass-like consolidation seen in the superior segment of the right lower lobe. Now let's look at the basilar cuts. The arrow is pointing towards the areas of ground glass attenuation, visible in a lower lobe predominant distribution, along with areas of traction bronchiectasis as highlighted by the second arrow. Based on this constellation of symptoms and HRCT features, the initial differential diagnosis could include diseases such as common interstitial lung diseases, atypical mycobacterial or fungal infections, invasive adenocarcinoma of the lung, or chronic microaspiration secondary to gastroesophageal reflux disease. Let's work our way through some of these common diseases and try to reach the correct diagnosis. This slide represents the latest American Thoracic Society classification of interstitial lung diseases. The top half shows the four broad categories of interstitial lung diseases. The category of idiopathic interstitial pneumonias is further subdivided into three different sets based on the tempo of disease progression, that is acute versus chronic, and exposure to cigarette smoke. Let's walk our way through this table and eliminate some of the possibilities. There are no known culprit drugs, and with negative connective tissue serologies, we can rule out the category of known causes. The disease distribution in this patient is very atypical for sarcoidosis, as sarcoid is more of an upper lobe predominant disease. The patient is a lifelong non-smoker, thus ruling out smoking-related diseases, the disease presentation is of a chronic, progressive nature, and as such, we can rule out the acute processes. So among the common interstitial lung diseases, we are left with the possibility of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and nonspecific interstitial pneumonia. Let's talk briefly about idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or IPF. IPF is the most common idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. It is typically a disease of older men with a history of exposure to cigarette smoke. The characteristic feature of IPF is the presence of usual interstitial pneumonia, either radiographically or on surgical lung biopsy. In classic cases, the diagnosis of IPF can be established based on critical review of HRCT alone, and biopsy is not required in these cases. On this slide, I am showing you the HRCT scan from a patient with IPF. This scan demonstrates all the features of usual interstitial pneumonia. The first arrow is pointing towards areas of reticulation, which are represented by the thick white lines. 
notice that the reticulations are most prominent in the subpleural areas of the lower lobes. The next image is showing you areas of traction bronchiectasis and honeycombing seen in patients with IPF. Lastly, notice the lack of ground glass attenuation on these images. Taken together, these features are highly specific for the diagnosis of UIP or IPF and are markedly different from the CT findings of our case. Let's talk briefly about nonspecific interstitial pneumonia or NSIP. NSIP is a common idiopathic interstitial pneumonia that is seen most commonly in association with other autoimmune conditions such as scleroderma. In some patients, ILD in the form of NSIP can be the presenting manifestation of an underlying connective tissue disease. The typical HRCT features of NSIP include bibasilar opacities with ground glass attenuation and reticulations. Honeycomb changes are typically not present. This is the CT scan from one of my patients with systemic sclerosis and NSIP. Notice the presence of bibasilar ground glass opacities with no evidence of honeycombing. While the lower lobe predominant ground glass opacities seen in our case could be consistent with NSIP, the upper lobe predominant pleural involvement and mass-like consolidation are inconsistent with the diagnosis of NSIP. Now that we have ruled out the common disorders, let's take a look at some of the uncommon interstitial lung diseases to consider in the differential diagnosis. I have compiled a list of four such disorders, and now let's walk through this list to see if our patient has one of these diagnoses. Let's begin with pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis, or PPFE. PPFE is a rare disease characterized by dense fibrosis of the visceral pleura and the adjacent pulmonary parenchyma, characteristically seen in an upper lobe distribution. It is typically seen in middle-aged patients. Another hallmark of PPFE is an increased risk of spontaneous pneumothoraces, with one-third of these patients experiencing at least one spontaneous pneumothorax. PPFE is now increasingly also being recognized as a late complication of lung transplantation. Here I have HRCT images from a patient with PPFE. On the left side is the mediastinal view showing the dense pleural thickening and fibrosis. On the right hand side is the lung window showing the pulmonary parenchymal involvement with the scarring. Notice the upper lobe predominance of these findings. Another HRCT image from the same patient with PPFE showing the pleuroparenchymal scarring as marked by the red arrow and the perihilar traction bronchiectasis and volume loss as marked by the green arrow. Notice that the lower lobes are completely normal appearing on HRCT. While our patient has the pleural and parenchymal involvement that can be seen in PPFE, the lower lobe involvement makes it less likely to be the underlying diagnosis. Now let's talk about hermansky pudlak syndrome or HPS. HPS is an autosomal recessive condition seen all over the world, but has a very high prevalence in Puerto Rico. HPS is characterized by oculocutaneous albinism, bleeding diathesis, granulomatous colitis, and pulmonary fibrosis. The pulmonary fibrosis in HPS can resemble IPF. Although a major clue is that the age of presentation in HPS is much younger than that of a typical IPF patient. Here we have a CT image from a patient with HPS showing the characteristic radiographic usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. Given that the patient in our case is 63 years old and lacks any of the other features of HPS, it is unlikely to be HPS. Now let's talk about IgG4-related disease. IgG4-related disease is a systemic fibroinflammatory disease that can involve multiple organs. While pancreatic involvement from IgG4-related disease is the most well-described manifestation, pulmonary involvement can be seen in 5 to 20% of patients. Pulmonary involvement from IgG4-related disease can have a variety of presentations, the most common being a mass-like consolidation, that can mimic a neoplasm. Other pulmonary manifestations of IgG4-related disease can include presenting as diffuse interstitial lung disease, mediastinal adenopathy, or pleural involvement with thickening and effusions. These are CT images from two patients with IgG4-related disease, highlighting the varying modes of pulmonary involvement. On the left is IgG4-related disease presenting as a mass-like consolidation, 
and on the right is a diffuse interstitial lung disease with both consolidative as well as ground glass opacities. Given the pleural involvement, the mass-like consolidation, and the ground glass opacities in our case, IgG4-related disease is a possible diagnosis that needs to be ruled out. So how do we make a diagnosis of IgG4-related disease? Serum levels of IgG4 can help. However, it is important to note that elevated levels of serum IgG4 are neither sensitive nor specific for this diagnosis. Histopathology is typically required to establish the diagnosis of IgG4-related disease with absolute certainty. The characteristic histopathological features of IgG4-related disease include the presence of a dense lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, a storyform fibrosis, obliterative phlebitis, and increased number of IgG4 cells on the biopsy. To further investigate the etiology, the patient underwent a surgical lung biopsy. Here I have a few slides from her lung biopsy. On the left-hand side, you can see the subpleural and lymphangetic pattern of distribution. And on the right-hand side, you can see the collagenous fibrosis and the inflammatory infiltrate. On high power view, the inflammatory cells were found to be histiocytes, and subsequent immunohistochemical staining of the histiocytes revealed that these were negative for CD1A and stained positive for factor 13. These findings were consistent with the diagnosis of Erdheim-Chester disease. Erdheim-Chester disease, or ECD, is a rare, non-Langerhans cell histiocytosis characterized by xanthomatous infiltration of the tissues by histiocytes that stain positive for CD68, but are negative for the typical Langerhans cell markers of CD1A and S100. ECD is a systemic disorder and can involve a variety of organ systems. I have highlighted the most common findings in this table. By far, the most common manifestation of ECD is symmetrical sclerotic involvement of the long bones, typically in the lower extremities. Given the high degree of extremity involvement in ECD and the complaints of leg pain in our case, we did a bone scan which showed increased uptake diffusely within the tibias and symmetrically at the distal diaphysis and the metadiaphyseal regions of each femur as well as distal left humerus, consistent with the diagnosis of ECD. Pulmonary involvement can be seen in approximately half of the patients with ECD and can take the form of ground glass attenuation, septal thickening, consolidation, and pleural involvement, a pattern consistent with our case. More recent evidence has demonstrated that activating mutations in BDAF and other MAP kinase proteins in the same pathway are seen in a majority of the cases of ECD, thus more accurately characterizing ECD as an inflammatory myeloid neoplasm. We performed next-generation sequencing on the lung tissue and identified an activating BDAF V600E mutation in our case. Targeted therapy with BDAF and MEK inhibitors was started, resulting in dramatic and sustained disease improvement. I will show you some representative cuts from this patient's CT chest demonstrating the response to treatment. This is the CT scan at the time of diagnosis, showing the ground glass involvement in the right lower lobe. This is the CT chest at one year follow-up, showing almost complete disease resolution. This is the CT chest after two years of follow-up, showing a sustained treatment response. Let's finish with a recap of the take-home messages from my talk. Detailed history and critical review of high-resolution CT scan are key to establishing the right diagnosis in patients with suspected interstitial lung diseases. Think about pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis in patients with upper lobe predominant disease, especially with a history of spontaneous pneumothorax. IgG4-related disease is a systemic fibroinflammatory disease that can have a variety of pulmonary manifestations, ranging from mass-like consolidation to interstitial lung disease and pleural involvement. HPS is an autosomal recessive condition characterized by oculocutaneous albinism, bleeding diathesis, and pulmonary fibrosis, typically seen in young individuals. And lastly, Erdheim-Chester disease is an inflammatory myeloid neoplasm harboring MAP kinase mutations that most commonly involves the long bones, but can involve a variety of other organs and responds well to targeted treatment. Thank you very much for your attention.